screen. And Sorry, we're, I think we're going live now. Oops. <laughs> Wonderful. To be continued. All right. Well, this is kind of magical that we are you know, out in our room and talking about yoga, actually. We're, we're getting some, some advice on the best ways to uh, uh, free your mind, to connect your mind to your body. And now suddenly we are uh, in our, our panel discussion. So let me um, move us out of our, our yoga chat and move us into our panel and say good morning or good afternoon to uh, folks who are with us. Uh, my name is Laura Dawson, and I am the North American lead for the Amazon Web Services Institute. Um, I will be leading a panel with uh, two experts who I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, and I will tell you that this is going to be the most fun panel of the day. So I, I hope that uh, anyone who's not with us is missing the fact that they're, they're not here because this is, uh, this is super interesting. We wanted to talk about the use of technology um, and data science and its role and relationship with uh, climate change mitigation um, as many Many of you know, I work for Amazon Web Services, which does a few things in the cloud. And so we're active in that space. And we were trying to think of the best ways that we could communicate some of these messages to a broader audience, to a global audience of business leaders, policymakers. And uh, what we decided is let's get some people who are absolutely expert in these issues, who are working on it every day, who have boots on the ground. And let's dive a little deep into a particular case application into a particular example of some really good work that's going on between uh, data science and climate mitigation at the local level. And then we would draw from that case some, some broader lessons for other communities and scaling more globally. So I would, I'm delighted to introduce you to my panelists today. Uh, I have Atanashri uh, Biswas, who is the Carbon Program Director at the Nature Conservation Conservancy. Hi, Tanish. And I also have Rachel O'Leary, Executive Director of City Plants USA. Hello. Hi. And these two folks are involved in an amazing urban tree program that if I try to describe it, I'm going to do it badly. So I'm going to ask them first to talk a little bit about themselves and their organizations, and then we're going to talk about this program that they're involved with. So let's start with Rachel. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. What's, what's City Plants? Yeah, happy to, happy to chime in. Um, thank you so much. It's a really an honor to be here with you two women. Um, so City Plants is, is a nonprofit founded by the city of Los Angeles, housed under Mayor Eric Garcetti's office and the Board of Public Works. Uh, that works with communities, businesses, city government, and state and federal agencies to plant thousands of trees across the city of LA. And we really do that from the ground up. It's a, I like to think of it as a very horizontal structure, micro fungal network of supporters working together toward a common goal to plant, to plant trees, particularly and predominantly in the areas that suffer from lack of, of shade and tree canopy. So we get to work with residents and, and activists, but also with um, levels of all government really to, to achieve tree planting and tree care in the city of Los Angeles. Great. And Tanu, I think a lot of people have heard of the Nature Conservancy, but tell us a little bit about what you do and what, how your organization is involved in, in data analytics. Sure. Thank you, Laura and Rachel. It's great to be here and um, have been on this panel. Um, so I work for Nature Conservancy, which is a global organization, and a lot of you already know about it. We work across 70 countries in the world, and we are guided by uh, uh, science and equity to really find solutions to problems in climate change and biodiversity loss. And my role is particularly in the space of climate change. And I work to see how data science and tech can be used to really advance climate mitigation and carbon sequestration on ground through by translating the complex science we do, data that we wrangle into really actionable item, actionable projects, demonstration projects to on, on natural working land and working land and urban areas to really show where action can be. And um, more so like how can 
these impacts be scaled up. And at, the, at my present role, I'm more working in the space of um, how forests can be used for climate mitigation. But as, as in the previous role where we connected, it was where I worked with Rachel, it was more about in the urban area. So uh, we work across uh, all spheres from policies to science to action on ground by partnering with local organizations like Rachel to see where science can touch ground. Great, great. Well, that's a great segue. Let's talk about the project that the two of you have worked on together uh, to plant trees in low income and underserved communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why the project has been so important? Rachel? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so I had the opportunity to work with Tano and the Nature Conservancy and actually utilize some of the the data that they've been working on um, to help us identify where are the most pressing needs for trees in the city of Los Angeles. And I like to, to talk about this by starting with the reality that Los Angeles is not alone. Tree equity is an issue that plagues most, most major cities across the country. And it's basically the idea that tree canopy and all of the benefits that trees provide are concentrated in wealthier, generally wider areas. And that's actually more and more research is pointing to by in, in large part by design um, and, and thanks to historical uh, racist federal housing policies like redlining that actually really have an impact today um, and how green spaces and trees in particular are distributed throughout a city. So when trees aren't distributed equitably, neither are there benefits. And so in Los Angeles, you have, you see that on, on a real level on, on the street, on, on a street you walk, you can see that in parts of Northeast Los Angeles, the Valley and South Los Angeles have uh, on average 10 to 15% canopy cover, but parts like Beverly Hills and Culver City and parts of the West Side have anywhere from 26 to 32% canopy cover. And we know in, on, at the city that's, that poses severe public health risks and, and, and threatens the vitality of our communities. Um, so a large, in large part, what we did with the Nature Conservancy was take some of the data that uh, Tanya had been in research that Tanya had been working on and use it as a tool to help us define where are the most vulnerable areas when it comes to uh, tree canopy equity, where are the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities, and what can we start to do to, to ameliorate and rectify that issue. Great, great. Tanu, can you talk about how you do this stuff? Uh, it sounds like a big load on your shoulders. Yeah, it's it's not just my, I share it with my other very talented colleagues who helped me address these questions. So, uh, yeah, so basically in our, we led a research at a national level across uh, 5,000 cities in the U.S. where we did a comparison of um, uh tree cover across at census block group level between high income and low income group across US and our results showed that there is a 15% difference in canopy cover, like on an average low income communities have 15% less cover and it was surprisingly systematic across 92% of the cities we studied and they were 1.5 degrees hotter. So the inequity that uh, redlining that Rachel talks about in LA is pretty much visible across entire US. So we, we did that study and we were, we were like, this is a systematic problem. And now how do we really find the solution towards it? And that's when we focused, drill down more in trying to look at the problem in California because heat island and urban uh, summer uh, heat uh, waves really is the one of the most, str most um, strongest and important driver that kills people every, every year. It is the strongest driver that impacts people directly more than any other climate impacts, whether it is flooding, hurricane, or even wildfire. It's literally like the it kills silently in people's homes, in those communities, in neighborhoods who are not able to like they're like the frontline communities and they have been uh, you know always been like not heard and they have been subjected to environmental injustice. And on an average, like every year. Uh, we, we wanted to address that problem that 
we saw this tree equity. Now, how do we really know what is the space available to plant trees? So we dive into satellite data and um, also available census data to really wrangle further using cloud computing and uh, available open source data sets to really drill down from a bird's eye view of across California, like, you know, what would it take for us to really solve this problem? Because that it's not just a problem of LA or just one city. How do we use open source technologies to really address tree cover inequity and uh, injustice and uh, heat island impacts to solve the problem, to really identify where there is space within the city where immediately we can go and impact and at least do something about it and address the problem. So, right. Coming at this as, as a novice, you know, I admire your work, but I don't know much about it. Why are trees that important? I mean, I live in Atlanta. We've got beautiful trees, although I have to say that in the low-income neighborhoods, you have a very hard time finding trees, and it's hotter. But we have beautiful trees in the wealthy neighborhoods. I'm from Canada, full of trees, and it's, it, they're nice to have. But why are they so important to human life? And what, what's the relationship between trees and um, other elements of, of environmental sustainability and preservation? Rachel? Yeah. I like to say um, that the I really have come to see trees as the powerhouse of the city, just like the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, to use an eighth grade biology analogy. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think trees provide so many services, some of which I think we all feel on a very visceral level when we're around them. Um, I like to point out that doctor, there are some doctors who have started prescribing nature uh, RXs to, to patients who are suffering from stress or illness. They actually give a prescription to their patients to go spend time in trees because it's been shown to lower cortisol levels, for instance, um, and improve mood and, and mental health. Um, so I think about the human health impacts of trees and benefits of trees. I feel those every day when I'm around them. But I also like to think of the environmental benefits. They sequester harmful greenhouse gases um, like carbon dioxide. Uh, they provide bi biodiversity and habitat for native birds and insects and animals um, in an urban environment, uh, which is super critical, um, retaining the world's biodiversity. Uh, I think they also have been their, their, their shade is life-saving. It can be life-saving, like Tanya mentioned, in, um, in the world of climate change in this new reality. And it's not, it's not a future reality. I feel it now in Los Angeles. Uh, we suffer from extreme heat, and we're, we're seeing increasingly more and more extreme heat events that do kill people. They kill and, and threaten the, the strength of our communities. Trees actually serve as a safety haven and a shelter for human beings in um, in a changing climate, and and help us deal with the, with those extreme heat events. Um, I could go on and on about the benefits of trees, but the biodiversity, mental health, and um, climate climate resilience benefits are huge, and the shade that they provide. Um, and I I really have come to see trees as the way a city treats trees, the way a municipality sees or values and prioritizes its urban forest, I've, I, I firmly believe is a litmus test for that city's entire climate change agenda and portfolio. Right. Um, if cities prioritize and recognize the value of an urban forest and the shade canopy and urban tree equity, they likely value a multitude of other climate um, agenda items, essentially. Right, right. Tanu, what's the big deal with trees? What's the urgency? Oh, I would say the most important urgent part is like the straight, like there's enough, there is enough scientific evidence that establishes the relationship between trees and temperature. There is a direct inverse correlation that wherever there is trees, it's cooler. In absence of trees, it's warmer. The, the need to work on it immediately and the urgency of that is currently we are in a climate stress. We are in a place where over the next 20 years, we need to take um, steps to really increase our tree cover, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and absorb our 
carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And trees can provide us that opportunity. And in urban areas where, eight, in case of uh, North America, where 80% of population lives in these cities, it has a huge impact. Because in absence of these interventions, we are going to really have severe impact every summer. We have seen heat strokes and we have seen a, a, a constant increase of uh, deaths from heat island over summer and entire uh, Pacific Northwest and Western U.S. is subjected to that risk that there will be a more of uh, higher frequency or more days of hotter days, not only just in LA, but starting all the way from British Columbia to Southern California. We have seen this in 2020. We have seen this severe impacts in 2006. So heat island and severe temperature rise is happening and it is going to continue. And this is going to cause huge amount of deaths. Like just by looking at the study that we led in California, we found that at least in California, if we just took the effort of increasing urban uh, trees in all the cities equitably, we have the capacity to add 34 million trees across all cities. And that will reduce the temperature down to 1.8. And that can further save almost 1,000, 4,000 lives over 10 years. So like I said earlier, the impact of heat is very severe and that we need to work on it now because trees take time to grow. And there is, there is, it is important that we invest on urban afforestation programs and projects on ground strategically within the cities, in the communities who have been deprived of shelter and shade and been subjected to this uh, disparity to take action now. So this is the time because otherwise we are going, we are ready. We are get, just gearing up for huge catastrophic events for communities. Yeah. So that was such an important point. I'm going to ask you to go back one and repeat that. What you said is that 34 million trees has what impact? The 34 million in the United States will have what impact? So this one, this is the study which uh, Rachel was replacing, uh, was mentioning, which we looked at uh, California level. Like if across 200 cities in California, how much space is actually available for urban afforestation where it's like currently it's bare and we can actually go and plant trees. So we found that around 1.2 million acres is available. And within that, 34 million trees can be planted. This is within the city boundaries. And doing that will reduce the temperature to by 1.8 degrees. And all the climate projections were like really are showing that how temperatures are going to continue rising in this city. So if we take the action now, we can really try to, at a level, not just in this isolated, siloed, uh, small, it, we need to scale up and like across, take large efforts so that overall, we see an overall um, temperature relationship. Because it's not just planting one tree, it's like across the whole landscape that it's an impact of having more trees across the entire area so the overall temperature comes down. Right, right. Well, I, I'm convinced. I don't know why everyone is not doing this immediately. Um, Rachel, can you talk about some of the barriers and challenges that you face in your work? Why aren't people just jumping up and doing this? It's the right thing to do. You've got the science. Yeah, we do. <clears throat> Excuse me, we do have the science. Um, the barriers are are vast. I like to kind of categorize them from the social, there's a social bucket of barriers, it's a political, economic, and infrastructural barriers. There's when the rubber hits the road and the pavement, is there space for a tree? Is there space for a tree in the communities that need them most? We got to utilize the, the work that the Nature Conservancy and Tanu spearheaded and take it a step further and ask ourselves, um, what do we do in what do we do when the communities that are most vulnerable, according to computation and models um, and data science, what do we do when those communities have virtually no space for trees? You don't have a parkway, you don't have a strip in between the sidewalk and the street. You have multi-residential apartment buildings um, with with many, many families living parcel to parcel, all building, no ground. There's no space for trees. Um, so the infrastructural barriers are pretty significant in the communities that 
our, our data is pointing to as the most vulnerable. And that's a problem that we are currently trying to figure out in Los Angeles. So we're looking at interventions that um, will require policy interventions and, and um, capital improvement projects along the lines of creating pocket parks in those communities so that if they don't have streets, trees lining their street, they at least have a pocket park that they can seek where they can seek refuge during extreme heat events. We're also looking at other interventions like taking away every six parking space to create create space for trees where there isn't space for trees, right? Um, so the infrastructural barriers is, is a real challenge. Um, and that I do like to go back to the, that's by design, that's by design. Um, and due to, due to systemic um, racist federal housing policies like Redline, it's not a coincidence that the communities that are most vulnerable and uh, typically most low income um, also don't have the space for trees. They're the the most heavily concretized. So the barrier to to actually achieving the recommendations that Tanu is pointing to, um, they are are vast. Um, On the social side, uh, there's a real distrust of government and and tree planting agencies. And this is not something that's unique to LA at all. I've talked, spoken to many colleagues um, who run tree planting programs across the country in urban centers. And I completely understand it. I think a lot of the communities that live, work and play um, and have been living and working and playing in their neighborhoods for generations have seen the lack of city services and the lack of benefits that they they receive and oftentimes do not have trust that when we plant a tree, we will continue to care for it and that it will continue to provide those benefits that we claim it will when we when we talk to them, when we engage them. Um, so distrust of, of agencies doing the work uh, and and I think the infrastructural barriers are pretty severe, but then there are also the policy barriers of, are there policies on the local level that actually protect the mature tree canopy that we do have already? That's a, a critical component and pillar of urban forest management is you're not just planting trees, you're protecting the trees that are that are 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, and are there are there actually progressive and and proactive tree equity policies on the books? And are politicians and and is the private sector willing to step up to really fund uh, these programs and projects at the levels that are required and needed? We've actually calculated in Los Angeles how much it'll cost us to to make a dent in tree equity. Um, the mayor of LA set a goal to increase canopy by fifty percent by 2028 in the areas of greatest need. And we did a, a project and a research study um, with a professor from Portland State University who identified that even if we planted every single available location, every single open parkway, we would still not reach that goal. So we know we need to take more, more drastic measures to get where we need to go. Right. So it's not just actions moving forward. You've got to undo history in a lot of cases and undo policies and practices that have been set in motion decades ago. It wow. really does feel like terraforming in some ways. Um, mm-hmm. It's the city's most major urban cores are not built with nature in mind. Um, and then you layer on the systemic uh, racism and we need to bring nature back to a city where, where nature was completely concretized and, and paved over. So yeah, performing is the is the example that I think of. Wow, Tanu, what about barriers? What uh, what barriers do you want to point to in in these endeavors? Um, I would totally second. There are some technical barriers and um, resources. Financial barrier is a big barrier in trying to achieve this target. Like in the national level study in US, we did where we looked across five thousand cities. A total investment of 17 billion is needed to really close the tree gap, the tree cover across at least these 5,000 cities. Are we willing to make that commitment? If we look at California, then at least within California, we have our we have the opportunity to really 
work in these areas. The amount needed, depending on whether you want to go to immediate areas where temperature, temperature needs to be reduced or you want to fill up the whole city that Rachel is talking about, it ranges from like, you know, 9 million to further up. So it is, it is not, it's, it's not a tree planting or maintaining trees. It's, it's not, we often don't pay attention to this. It's not a, a cheap endeavor. It's like a full on maintenance of these trees. The infrastructure like that Rachel was mentioning, like, you know, we really need to have um, infrastructure to maintain these trees, monitor these trees. So there is, not the technology is not there to really monitor trees uh, remotely and there is that's a barrier which can be addressed through tech there is there isn't financial resources to um, plant and after planting to really monitor them they're like a 20-year project just like following up with a teenager that you have to come <laughs> to and uh, make sure that their needs are met and they survive the threat from climate uh, diseases and all of that. And um, the, the other barrier is collaboration. Like, you know, we need to see more uh, connected and interconnected engagement with policymakers and uh, academics and scientists so that we can tackle this together. And there is like also the, the how do we generate an amount like this? It cannot be just a program which is supported just by an urban forestry program for that particular city. Resources like from federal programs or state programs or other private and um, uh, public sectors, they all have to come together. Like, you know, it impacts health. Maybe think of ways of how different sectors like health, utility, transportation, all of this can combine and come together to really take a social responsibility that, you know, this is a huge problem and, uh, inequity is at the heart of it, uh, and how do we come together to address that problem? And so yeah. I would say um, political willingness and uh, lack of resources is our first barrier. Like, you know, we, we yeah. kind of like that we need to tackle. We need to be willing to address and as you say, this is a long-term commitment. You just don't plant the tree and walk away. It's like, as you say, a teenager, you have to invest in this thing over 20 years to make sure, at least 20 years. Mine go yeah. much longer, but to make sure this thing works. Um, I, I want to back up a little bit and talk about uh, data science and the use of data science for this project and similar projects. So I'll start with you, Tanu. Um, tell me how data science, I mean, you've touched on this before, but let's, let's uh, go back a little bit. How does data science make the work of organizations like City Plants more effective? Uh, and maybe what are some of the new opportunities that you see technology providing in the future? Yeah, happy to take that. Um, I think data science, cloud computing is at a place where we are innovating every day and we have the ability to really advance and really support groups who are working on ground like Rachel's to provide them with the data set, to provide action ready data sets. Like, you know, currently we are, we have mapped, there are like AI machine learning algorithms which can very easily map where the trees are but we need to be able to have something more automated and more regular that uh, 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 groups working on ground can monitor change over time just in tree cover. That's the basic that I think we can work towards at, and for urban trees, like, you know, we, there is like all the satellites which are up, um, uh, we are using that is available, which helps us give access to the data set. But the next step is really trying to see what is the what is the metric of success. So we should be there is a lot of innovation and science that is still needed to really understand how these um, how the our intervention of tree is really impacting temperature. While there has been a lot of development in monitoring or in mapping trees or in uh, advancing that part, we do not have data where we can talk about the temperature variability. We, I, it's not monitored at that resolution across different cities to really drill down on it. And then ultimately, how does 
how does planting trees ultimately impact like you know model it out in future climate scenarios and see what is the potential for reducing temperature for sequestering carbon and tap into that so there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and cloud computing and data and tech can totally drive this in in uh, beyond just mapping trees and that whole space needs a lot more collaboration and uh, innovation so there is there is I think we are just in the beginning of that innovative space of how we can use open source tech data to provide action ready products where um, a small organize, an organization who are working at a ground level do, have, do not have to put so much resources to generate a data set. That responsibility can be taken up by uh, other folks who are in the tech field, who are in the industry field to provide that uh, kind of information. Great. Um, I, you mentioned earlier, and I just want to follow up on this, does open source play a role in, in some of the things that you're doing? Oh, yes, absolutely. Because we are pro, pro, processing like, you know, large amount of satellite data, large volume. Imagine processing uh, satellite data across entire California and processing that. Imagine processing all the census block group level data at California scale. Or if we want to go big at the national scale for the U.S. level study, so a lot of cloud computing and uh, open source data sets come into play, including uh, Google, AWS, and everything, which is like providing us access to these data sets to uh, run the algorithms on the cloud, which makes it easy rather than running it on your desktop, training your algorithm with uh, to train your AI algorithm with ground training points. So all of that can be now done in the cloud. And so that process has improved, but there is still a lot more to do. Right. So it is a, the more that we share data and processes, uh, the less onerous the commitment and the investment becomes for individual communities. Yes. Then it becomes easy for them to, OK, I, I have a product. Now I can straight go and see where I can have some action. So it, it's like, you know, data and science, we will always be providing. We can always provide the bird's eye view, or maybe even at a final resolution of what is possible. But ultimately, folks and groups like City Plants and Rachel's group who are connected to the ground reality, what the ground situation is, can translate that into outcomes, into actions. So we have to develop that resources so that we can bring them along and showcase their work and really like, you know, uh, push, scale those efforts bigger rather than individual uh, isolated events. Yeah. Now, Rachel, from, from your perspective on the ground, um, what's your take on the uh, capacities and opportunities provided by, by data and anal analytics and the, uh, and the limitations? Yeah, it's such a great question. I, and I appreciate it um, because I think running a tree planting organization in a, in a major city, 500 square miles, millions and millions of people can feel pretty overwhelming. Um, and, and we're at a really unique point in Los Angeles, I think in urban forestry and our, and our, and how we utilize data. Um, in just the, the eight years that I've been doing this work, uh, we've got tools like the nature that the nature conservancy has developed through Amazon web services and cloud technology, Google has released their tree canopy lab that's providing multiple cities across the country and around the world with um, a snapshot of their tree canopy at a really, really fine resolution and also showing, giving us the ability to monitor that canopy change over time, which is hugely significant in terms of understanding if we're actually having the impact that we're, we're aiming for that change over time component. Um, and then but previous to, to Google and, and the Nature Conservancy's tool, cities did spend millions of dollars on, on collecting this data um, and packaging it in ways that made it analyzable and accessible by the general public. Um, so that then folks like City Plants could take that to policymakers and to communities alike and really um, make a case for why trees are urgently needed. Um, where I see, I see 
so much possibility. And I really liked what you said, Tanu, about the the change over time and monitoring component. I think we th we have tons of data sets. We have all the data to know where we should be planting trees roughly on a like block by block level. Um, where the frontline communities are, who's the most vulnerable, who needs, who, you know, what's that prioritization metric, matrix? Where should we be planting first? Where should we be allocating resources first? Um, and we have the ability now because of cloud technology to layer tons of data sets on top of each other, urban heat data, um, tree canopy cover, uh, education levels, housing, housing levels, income levels, race and ethnicity. We can layer all of these data sets and really kind of understand the issue where I think the limitations are, um, is that monitoring and change over time component. But more importantly, we can show communities tons of data and say, look, you live in a low canopy community. I know you feel the, the heat in the midst of summer. Doesn't that suck? We can't, that data won't convince residents um, by itself to plant trees. That data does not always address the human component. And so I see um, nonprofits and, and city city agencies and, and the, collaborative, the collaborative network um, working to solve this issue, we're constantly thinking about how do we engage communities in a way that centers their voices, centers their opinions. They're the ones who live, work, and play on the streets where they live um, in these urban areas. What do they actually want? What is their vision for the city and how do trees factor into that? Um, so I think that it's just the, the community organizing component of this work and and the it starts with conversations. It starts with, with door knocking and canvassing. And, and that's something that data helps us, uh, helps us with, but doesn't fully get us there, right? So um, the human component of the work, I would say. Yeah, and it, as you say, the most vulnerable communities are the ones that are feeling this first and they are most impacted and they are the least able to organize and exert influence and voice. And those of us in wealthier communities with beautiful trees are like, oh, I don't, I don't see a problem. Um, so uh, that, that human dimension and taking up the cause on behalf of our most vulnerable community, I think is, is a point you've made very well. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about scaling because we have been talking about a program. I mean, you've been doing the two of you programs in, in different areas and different programs, but we were talking about a program that's largely localized to, to Los Angeles, which is huge in and of itself. But how can we scale that work at a local level to uh, the state level, the national level, even uh, the global level? How can we connect um, this, this, this stuff up? Um, Tanu, do you have some ideas? Yeah, I can speak towards it. Um... We have enough, enough evidence and scientific data, which um, I pointed out across the whole academic literature, to show that there is a problem of tree cover inequity. There is a problem of urban heat island. It, it is the, my vision, my dream is to really see that there is a federal program in place to increase urban tree cover, which supports each state, so that it is no more the burden on just the states to really provide that revenue needed to take such a huge lift. And it is a commitment, not just from, from so you, you demonstrate that willingness that um, uh, uh, which, which brings resources and support from um, national as well as local partners. And that could be a great way from the political side of it or the policy side of it of how we can scale such program. From the data side of it, we can very easily with today's technology, whether we use the work that I did or other collaborators are already doing, we can pretty much like, you know, provide a bird's eye, the work that I did in California, we did, uh, we can pretty much provide a bird's eye view of what is the tree inequity, where we need to put efforts, but ultimately, like, you know, we can scale it across the entire country, across all the cities. So from the data side, we can provide the bird's view. And we can also have other ways of scaling, which is like, how do we really take the work that, um, Rachel did and, and is doing in her neighborhood, in her community, how do we tell, take those stories in, in, and scaling it up and really telling that story to 
other communities within California, Northern California, across the country, and how we can create opportunities to learn from each other. So I see a huge opportunity for us of cross collaboration uh, in terms of exchange of knowledge, sharing data to scale, and making a lot of these data sets freely available and creating policy pathways to generate revenues to really uh, scale this effort across the entire country. Great. Uh, and and you, Rachel, what, what are you thinking about advice for scaling? To be honest, I think um, it's such a interesting question because my, my gut response is actually we're not at the place to scale yet. Um, those infrastructure uh, barriers that I identified, I think, you know, what do we do in those in those in those communities where that we have identified are incredibly in urgent need of trees um, for public health and for climate resilience on the local level. What do we do when we can't, when there's no physical space for trees? Data doesn't fully tell us that yet. It doesn't tell us how to work with communities to, you know, have a whole block sign up to sacrifice six parking spots on their street, for instance, to make space for trees, right? Um, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is that in a city as large as Los Angeles, uh, the scale is already really big and we're still on the cusp of finding, of coming up with some of those, those solutions. What are, what are those, those bigger interventions that cities need to be taking? Um, so I think, I think we're looking in Los Angeles, we're doing research on the street by street level. We've taken it from the bird's eye view we have that data now, thanks to the work of AWS and, and the Nature Conservancy. But we now are zooming straight into the kind of lowest, smallest geographic unit, which is a street, a single street. How do we start there um, and then scale? So I think I'm really excited for the scaling conversations. I think we have a lot of work to do before we can get there. We need a proof of concept, right? Um, we're actively building that in Los Angeles now and doing it in a way that engages the, the communities and the neighbors on the streets that we're identifying and targeting for these case studies. Um, but in terms of, I really appreciate, Tanya, your point of the layers of connection between community, local, regional, state and federal government, um, between research and academia and practitioners. That's something that I think LA has um, managed to progress and innovate on the issue of tree equity precisely because of the partnerships at play. And to use a tree analogy and to return to something I shared at the beginning, I think I've come to see those layers of government and decision making makers and um, researchers and, and practitioners at every scale as uh, kind of the mycorrhizal fungal network of support that are, is helping um, cities and, and, and cities all across the world really tackle the issue of tree canopy equity. So we, we need to support each other in that, continue to share resources, share data, share science as we have been, um, and share problems openly too. I feel like Rachel is an experienced campaigner because every question I ask her ends with a call to action. <laughs> and I appreciate that so much. Tanu, what's your call to action? If you're a, a policymaker, if you're a uh, an investor, a business person uh, watching this, what would you invite them to do? I would invite them to invest on uh, tree planting projects and invest on policies which are progressing for or pushing for uh, urban afforestation programs, invest in these two, because these are the two places where we can uh, touch ground because, you know, uh, how do we really make an impact is really by investing in the communities that are being impacted and then Let's really do that on ground by really scaling more uh, tree plantation projects, building towards the infrastructure of it and committing to monitoring of it, not just financially, but also developing the tech and science needed to show progress and show that how uh, not just shade, temperature, but carbon and so many other things can be sequestered, can be addressed just by and, and lives, human lives that will be saved by doing this, investing in in the monitoring of these trees and doing more 
tree plantation projects and in policies that really push for state programs or federal programs to support such uh, um, actions on ground. Great, great. And if people want to get more information, Rachel, they should go to the City Plants website? Yes, www.cityplants.org. And Tanu, where should they go? To TNC's website, uh, Tanushri, if you just Google or LinkedIn, I'm available at both places. Great, great. And I understand that uh, AWS is working with you to put together a blog on our site to talk about the, uh, the, the shade, Urban Shade Project and a video. So we're all very excited to, uh, uh, to see that. Um, we seem to have hit the end of our time, although they're telling me that they're not going to cut us off entirely. Any last words before we, we disappear? Just a, a note of gratitude to both of you for elevating this conversation and for your work. Um, thanks to AWS for supporting the work of Tree Canopy Equity and to the Nature Conservancy and Tanu for highlighting Los Angeles as a case study. Great. And Tanu? I would like to really thank uh, Rachel for bringing science to action for somebody who has uh, dealt a long time with remote sensing and satellite data. She was the person who touched the plane down and brought landed it and like trans translating science to action, which is extremely rewarding and motivating to continue working in this space and really seeing action happening. So a big thanks to her and of course to AWS team for bringing this story and highlighting the need to really look at this silent uh, 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 I would. I don't want to end on a negative note. The the problem that we have that uh, we can solve it together so that we can all come together to to airing the story and making it an important topic to talk about on equity and tree cover and injustice in the environment sector. Great. Well, I would like to thank our uh, AWS nonprofit team for bringing us all together and also to our participants for um, your your time and attention. And there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.